Thanks so much. Um, I'm, I'm just so excited to be here. It's been uh, such a great visit so far, um, speaking with all the postdocs. Uh, yeah, um, uh, this is just such a great honor. So uh, thanks so much for inviting me. And um, Yeah, I talked um, yesterday actually mostly about outreach and uh, then a little bit about idealized models. But uh, now it's to the science. But I'm going to try to make some uh, connections back with the, the seminar from yesterday, too, which I think will be online, too, if anybody missed it. Um, I believe it was. Uh, we did the webcast with that, just like uh, this one. So, um, yeah. So, but today, how the sea, land, ice, and mountains move the rain. Um, a little bit of each of these, um, with with uh, a lot about the sea. So, don't don't think that it's going to be a five-hour you know seminar just because <laughs> this first one lasts for a while. Um, but we're gonna. Uh, uh, although, you know, if the doors get locked, and I do, you know, yeah, I wouldn't mind giving a five-hour talk. Um, yeah. Uh, the sea, what are the ways that the ocean affects tropical rain? Do circulations in the high latitudes even matter for, uh, for uh, climate? And um, I always like to give away the answer, the final answers at least. Um, first, um, which is that the ocean circulation, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, we think is the dominant reason that the ITCZ is in the northern hemisphere uh, to begin with. And you know, a lot of the action from that is in the really high latitudes, right? But the, that warmth in the North Atlantic uh, makes its way into the tropics. Um, the cold uh, Southern Ocean temperatures are felt uh, all across the Earth. Um, and then also looking a little bit about whether that has an impact on the Southern Ocean winds. The, the storm systems there are so strong highest waves anywhere, um, but we actually found relatively little impact. But anyway, first, um, I'm actually going to start with a little bit of history, which is the first purely scientific voyage. This has been made, the claim has been made that this is the first purely scientific voyage uh, ever. Anybody want to guess when, who, um, uh, before? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, um, yeah. Uh, so it's actually Haley, Edmund Haley, the comet guy, um, led the, uh, and you know, a lot of people say Halley, right? But I mean, we don't say Coriolis, right? Or whatever the French should be of that, right? So I'm calling him Haley because that's what, you know, um, the name is, has come to, right? <laughs> it, because of Bill Haley in the comments, probably. But um, anyway, Haley uh, lived in uh, mid. 1600s and had this first purely scientific voyage in 1700. Um, and I like this story actually because I think I've always wanted to like the history of exploring, but there's so much conquering and horrible, horrible people involved with that that it's cool to find one that's, uh, that's actually a scientist, right? Um, and Haley was quite a guy. Um, you know, sometimes you get things named after people that didn't really do, you know, too much other science, but he was quite a guy. Um, he was indeed the first to predict the next appearance of his comet. Um, he also was the driving force behind Newton really doing the work of the Principia. He recognized that that was just a completely groundbreaking thing. Um, so uh, really, really encouraged him to, to write that up. And then Newton kind of went crazy with it for a while. And uh, he paid the journal charges for it, um, for the Principia, the color figure fees, right? The open access, <laughs> open access charge, um, yeah. Um, he was also kind of an experimentalist, too, um, not just a pure theoretician like Newton uh, kind of was, I guess. Um, so he built a diving bell and went underneath it, um, wrote a paper called The Art of Living Underwater. <laughs> um, also even kind of injured his eardrums in this thing because of rapid pressure changes. Um, I learned a lot about Haley by following him on Twitter. Um, <laughs> and at Haley's log, this apparently is a thing that uh, history of history people do. They tweet what the person that they study was doing on a particular day, you know, X amount of time later. And right now, um, this is a, a grad student or maybe somebody who just finished their PhD um, in England who's studying the history of Haley's science. Um, uh, and she tweets his, his logs and then a little description and links to blog entries and stuff and is, is uh, going through the one that I followed a year or so ago, um, again, to uh, describe some of this. So I learned basically all of this from, from her research through Twitter. Um, his life, um, he was the son of a wealthy soap maker from London. Um, he did uh, an RU, 
at Oxford um, with the Astronomer Royal, actually the first uh, Astronomer Royal, so undergrad research, just like me, you know, see a lot of, uh, no, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so he was an assistant to the first Astronomer Royal um, at 18 when he went to college um, and later became the second Astronomer Royal. Um, he did a study abroad um, in college to um, he went to St. Uh, Helena in the South Atlantic, 16 South, to set up an observatory there um, and observed the transit of Mercury, right? So this is when the planet goes across the sun and really figured, he knew the geometry of stuff really well, so realized what kind of things you can understand from, uh, from that, you know. Um, and if you, he, he, he figured out, especially if you could observe a transit at different parts of the Earth, um, like a Venus in particular, then you could calculate the Earth-Sun distance incredibly accurately. And, and uh, transits of Mercury are pretty common. They're like 12 a century. Uh, transits of Venus are pretty rare. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, like 100 years later, they did that and used his method um, when Venus uh, came by. Um, he got his uh, uh, master's at 22 and then was uh, a fellow of the Royal Society, so went up you know, pretty quickly. But he was also really an atmospheric scientist, too. Um, and I think, in part, you know, inspired by going down in, into the South Atlantic. Um, but he published this uh, theory of atmospheric motion. So we call it the Haley. Hadley circulation um, sometimes, um, you see that. Um, this idea of solar heating driving uh, driving motions, he really talks about, um, uh, yeah, that, that there are, um, and just has this remarkable, in that same paper, remarkable representation of the winds, right? The weather systems in general um, that, you know, we were still figuring out the geography of the planet at that time, right? But um, he even mentions in this paper the ITCZ. Uh, he calls it the calms and tornadoes. Um, and right in here, here's the calms and tornadoes. Can you all see that? Um, between 4 and 10 north, it seems condemned to perpetual calms, tended with terrible thunder and lightning and rains so frequent that our navigators from Mentz call this part of the sea the rains. <laughs> um, so uh, he noticed that uh, feature and that it's north of the equator. right? Um, yeah, his, his theory of the motions wasn't correct in that um, he thought that the easterlies came from the diurnal movement of the sun and rising and sort of the air following the rising motion. Um, but that even was a really big advance because um, people had talked about like plant algae breathing and that causing the winds before that, you know. So um, it's, it is quite an advancement. This, this is, um, you can get this on the... Uh, <laughs> QJ or something. one of the journals like it goes back to 1700, you know. And, uh, this is what it looks like. You gotta like turn the S's into <laughs> right. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. Um, so his voyage. Um, I'm talking way too much about this already. I don't know. <laughs> I get carried away here, but um, he uh, asked the government for a research vessel to study long, basically to try to get longitude. This was a major, major problem for a long time. Like. You can get latitude from the stars, but not longitude. And they're looking at all sorts of different ways to figure out longitude. Um, so he wanted to study the magnetic field of the Earth, like the deviation of compasses from the true north, to see if that might be a way that you could get longitude. Um, and sailed pretty deep into the southern hemisphere. Um, they gave him this really small ship, um, fast maneuverable ship. Um, and uh, yeah, it was not. You know, so he was the captain of the ship, right? Um, it did not go smoothly. Um, his uh, officers, in particular the first officer, did not, like he would say, go around the island this way. And the guy would go around the island the other way. <laughs> and one day he's like, we're turning this ship around. And they turned around and went back to London and they court-martialed the guy. Um, he basically got no punishment whatsoever, um, and they later, Haley later found out, you can read his logs about this stuff too, that it was because he reviewed his book years before, and he was mad that, that he had proposed, you know, oh, here are my new ideas about longitude. It was all stuff that was ripped off, you know, and not good scientific contributions. Um, so the guy was, had a personal vendetta based on that um, that he didn't find out until after the court martial. Um, uh, he got fired upon. 
Right? Haley, one of the greatest scientists, had a cannon shell go through his mast, um, rip through the sails. Uh, because they thought he was a pirate. There had been pirates in the area around then. This was the golden age of piracy. Um, this was like Blackbeard times. You know, they're going around North Carolina, you know, coastal North Carolina, where I'm from. And uh, uh, yeah, in Newfoundland, there had been a pirate attack, and they saw this small ship coming. And you know, um, yeah, um, he was arrested under suspicion of being a pirate. Um, they, you know, he came into the port and said, "We're studying." No, magnet. We're doing science, and they're like, "No way!" They searched his boat. Um, he had he spent the night in jail, and they searched his boat, and all they found was data. Um, <laughs> and then embarrassingly let him go. You know, um, yeah. Um, but it was really, really a big success. Um, made really, really accurate measurements on the voyage. Um, you know, even describing how the waves are breaking over the mast, but they're up there, you know, trying to measure the compass and the stars. And, um, you know, these are really, really high seas there. Um, and then he also really talks about this. This is what struck me and actually inspired a research idea that I will actually talk about later. This is not um, just the story for the talk. Um, is, you know, they start describing it's so cold here. I can't wait for this weather system to break. Um, and uh, then the weather you know, doesn't happen with one after the other. It's rigid down there. He was there in the middle of summer. It's below freezing. Um, and it didn't, didn't let up at all with the change in the, in the weather. Um, it's really cold down there. Um, and this is the thing that kind of inspired, inspired the research. He went all the way down to 52 and a half south. Um, they you know, were looking for terra incognito, right? Um, saw land one evening. They drew some pictures of the white cliffs. And then uh, next morning, I realized oh, oh, it was an iceberg. Um, they barely, having that really you know, easily turnable boat, small boat, helped a lot to avoid those and then make it home safely. Um, and uh, this is the, the, is the line of his voyage, right, going through the ICC at uh, 52 and a half south. Um, OK, back to the science. Uh, the Southern Ocean, indeed, is really, really cold. This is a map of uh, SSTs. Um, it goes down to 60 uh, degrees, right, is the cutoff on each of these hemispheres. So you can see just how much colder it is in the southern high latitudes than the northern. This is January. All right. So uh, even in the middle of winter, off the coast of England, it's much, much warmer than in the middle of summer in the Southern Ocean at the same latitude. So if you look at uh, average temperature at, uh, yeah, 52 and a half south is about 4C in summer. Um, average temperature at 52 and a half north is 8C in the winter. Um, uh, and here it is in July, right? Much, much bigger difference. Um, you know, the ocean's kind of slow to, uh, to change, right? But but anyway, that's the that's the plots from uh, Hartman. Um, also, just much much nor warmer north of the equator in the tropics in general. Um, you know, you can definitely see that in the annual mean, SSTs are much warmer north of the equator than south of the equator. Um, so uh, and then tropical rains also maximize in the northern hemisphere. So these are Haley's calms uh, and tornadoes, right? In the same location that it actually is and. Uh, in a zonal mean, it's clearly north of the equator as well. Um, you see it in the East Pacific as well, less so in the West Pacific, not in the Indian Ocean. That's an exception. Um, but uh, yeah, in the zonal mean for sure, and definitely in the Atlantic. Um, it's also really, really windy in the Southern Ocean. Um, here's the annual mean zonal wind stress. It's just you know tremendously strong persistent winds um, and having 15 meter waves is not uncommon uh, down there um, it's it's less seasonal there that's a big part of it right is that um, in January we get really strong storms in the northern hemisphere here um, but in uh, in winter in the southern hemisphere they're even stronger in places um, and in the summer you get those rip roaring storms as well. Um, I think it's always important when you talk about the southern ocean winds, at least I like to, that we have changed the strength of those winds, those January winds. We've increased the strength by 20% with ozone depletion. Um, that's known basically without a doubt. You know, um, 
So these strongest weather systems in the world have been modified by, by us in an extremely unexpected way, right? Um, so uh, I think that's pretty remarkable. OK, so anyway, what's the connection of this to uh, ocean circulation? Um, well, uh, the AMOC brings a lot of water northward, right? Um, got the sinking in the near Greenland, um, and that just flushes out all the cold water and brings warm water northward, um, 600 trillion joules a second. Um, and the upwelling in the Southern Ocean keeps it cold there. Um, why does this happen in the uh, Atlantic and not the Pacific? Um, well, Elizabeth uh, Maroon is a new uh, uh, postdoc at, at CU um, with uh, Jen Kay. Um, so she's going to give a talk, I think, in January, February. April. Oh, OK, OK. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'll change this. <laughs> yeah, no, different resolution. And to, uh, yeah, yeah, so um, anyway, in the spring, uh, she'll be talking about that. Or I'm sure she'd be happy to talk with you about it beforehand. Um, yeah, so uh, she's done these really cool experiments that I think identify a really clear mechanism for, for uh, the very least part of the reason, if not the main reason why. Um, but I'll leave that for her. Um, why? Uh, oh, and then. Um, we do know, too, from, from a lot of studies that tropical rainfall is affected even by high latitude stuff. Um, so sinking in high latitudes uh, can make it all the way back into the tropics. Um, because basically, the atmosphere is kind of diffusive. Um, if you warm in a particular place, that's going to spread to other latitudes. Um, uh, you know, as an atmospheric dynamicist, it's, it's maybe a little disappointing that one of my main research results has been that some some of the atmosphere, at least in terms of heat transport, is pretty pretty simple. You know, um, diffusive uh, fluxes um, is not a bad way to as a, as a starting point, at least. Um, yeah. So papers like Chang and Bits changed sea ice and high latitudes, and that affected tropical rainfall all the way down. Um, this is a theory that was uh, developed in at least for us, uh, developed in this gray radiation model that I talked about yesterday. Um, and uh, yeah, things like radiation and ocean circulation definitely have an uh, important role as well. And in couple models, this has a component where part of that energy flux happens in the ocean, too, um, for sure, which is something Clara and uh, Jen Kay have looked at uh, a lot lately. Um, it's been some really nice work there. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you do expect, though, that if you have heat coming in and out in the high latitudes, that it can make it all the way to the tropics and, and, uh, and affect the ITCZ. Um, so why does the AMOC flux heat northward? Why do you sink in the northern hemisphere and not the southern hemisphere? Um, a lot of people have pointed to the Drake Passage as being really key to that, the fact that there is a circumpolar ocean, right? circumpolar current all the way around there. Um, and I kind of always took this for granted, you know, as completely determined, you know, that that was the reason. But actually, a lot of these early studies were with kind of intermediate complexity models that haven't really been tested uh, as much in fully coupled models until recently. Um, but anyway, we we looked at it in an idealized coupled GCM that was originally uh, developed by Farnetti and Vallis, uh, Ricardo Farnetti and Jeff Vallis. Um, they just took this gray radiation model and put an ocean below, like a comprehensive ocean model below, MOM. Um, and uh, yeah, um, did some cool studies about uh, uh, you know all sorts of coupled dynamics. Um, Going to try to argue that coupled problems, there's a lot of future in, in understanding climate in that uh, direction, uh, I think. Um, so we just ran it in a perfectly rectangular ocean basin, and then added a Drake passage uh, down here right, to try to test that idea. Um, we're not the only people who've done this, but um, indeed, when you open up a Drake passage in this model, a big AMOC forms. Um, so these are the, uh, this is the stream function, right? Um, and uh, yeah, um, so that Drake passage does, does help with that. Um, I think it's kind of because you're salty, you need very salty cold water to have your deep water production, right? Um, the saltier water is in the subtropics. And if you have a closed basin, then western boundary currents and stuff can bring that salinity uh, poleward pretty easily. Um, whereas if you have a circumpolar current, then you have a lot of equine transport that's pushing in the other direction, right? That kind of keeps the salinity from getting there. Um, eddies come into the picture as well. Um, and uh, anyway, but when we run this experiment, we find, indeed, that you get this big AMOC that forms. Um, uh, 
anyway, th this paper is, is has, I think, is a really important paper in some ways, but it hasn't been widely cited, partially because I think the figures are not terribly <laughs> good quality. And, um, the contours here are supposed to show that like you get 4K warming here, all the way down to a few tenths of a K, 0.5K. Um, uh, in um, this Drake Passage um, simulation. It does spread all the way to the tropics. Um, and if you look at the precipitation, it really clearly shifts northward as well. You get a moistening in the northern hemisphere and a drying in the southern hemisphere. Um, so the claim is that uh, the ocean, right, when you have an AMOC, fluxes a lot of heat northward largely first expressed in the high latitudes, then it kind of is spread by diffusive atmospheric energy transports uh, into the tropics. Um, there's a requirement to transport heat uh, from the warmer hemisphere to the colder hemisphere by the Hadley cell, and then uh, the Hadley cell brings moisture back northward. Um, so that's sort of the full theory. Um, you can check out the papers to see all the details of this. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this is pretty good evidence from this very simple situation that that's uh, uh, a theory for this. Um, the previous idea that I'd always learned um, is, is George Philander's idea about tilting coastlines being the main reason. This Philander, uh, 1996, says that because, you know, um, North America and Africa and kind of Asia all tilt in this direction, that gives a preference eventually for precipitation being more in the northern part of the tropics. Um, and we run that in this model, and it actually gives a slight preference for the southern hemisphere um, when we run with tilted basins. It's not like that. And the reason for this is that uh, you get a AMOC set up in the other direction. This, uh, um, you get deep water production in the southern hemisphere from this asymmetry, which beats any kind of local tropical mechanism. Um, yeah. Um, but then when we add a direct passage, then the rain shifts north of the equator. Um, so. Uh, yeah, um, so this is at least some cl coupled climate model, you know, evidence that maybe the Drake Passage is really key. Maybe, at the very least, it's the northern hemisphere, uh, you know, the deep water production being there, uh, causing the northern hemisphere to be warmer in general. Um, so we wanted to look at this in more comprehensive models. Um, so what we did was we ran a slab ocean GCM. Um, with the observed Q fluxes first, right? The observed surface energy fluxes put in, and that's on the left here. It's a model that has a pretty good climatology. Um, so it does maximize in the northern hemisphere to begin with. And then what we did basically was just symmetrized it between north and south. We added whatever we needed so that the zonal mean at each latitude was the same, like at 50 north and at 50 south. So there's no preference for the northern hemisphere to have more. Essentially, we're removing the cross equatorial energy transport that's implied by the observed surface fluxes, right? And when you do that, um, it seems like a subtle change to the heat fluxes. But it's actually plenty to give you just an ITCZ in the southern hemisphere. Um, so uh, yeah, I think this is really good complementary evidence that indeed that the AMOC is the reason for this. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the result. Um, yeah. Um, how about in a coupled comprehensive GCM? You know, um, again, this, I think, always good to make sure that ocean circulation, like, there, there's, there's, uh, clear reasons to think that slab ocean models do this too much as compared to fully coupled models. Um, uh, so uh, uh, this is probably exaggerated to some extent. How much, you know, is another question. I think uh, we know actually the reason for uh, why it's southern hemisphere in this setup is because the uh, it's essentially because of the albedo of the Sahara Desert is a big, big cooling influence on the northern hemisphere. So if you don't have the ocean heat transport to flux a lot of heat northward, then the southern hemisphere is actually warmer than the northern hemisphere. Um, but anyway, let's let's uh, try this out in a coupled model, um, and this is something that has clear paleo implications. Um, so the Drake Passage was closed until about 50 million years ago or so, and maybe opened in fits and starts after that um, for for a while. Um, uh, so. Uh, 
um, uh, we we ran the simulation and then, then like stupidly realized that that they had done it already. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, um, basically built a wall across the Drake Passage, made Antarctica pay for it. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, yeah, made NSF pay for it. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Um, uh, yeah, so build, just building a wall, right? Um, in otherwise current uh, geography. So this is not trying to do an accurate paleoclimate reconstruction. It's just to say, what's the effect of an open Drake Passage in the current climate? Um, and they ended up running it with and without a Panama Seaway. And what we're doing right now is running it with higher CO2 um, just to do something different. Um, you know, and that ends up having a little bit of an effect. But here we go. Here's the result. Is it actually you get... So we were expecting, right? The AMOC would shut off, the rain would shift south, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the first step doesn't happen in that argument. The AMOC doesn't shut down. So the single basin idea, as it turns out, is not good enough for some reason. Um, and I don't really understand this at all yet. But um, yeah, it sort of points to some new stuff out there. And we still argue that. Um, Definitely, it's the AMOC that causes the big energy transport um, and causes the ITCC to be north. But I think we need to kind of rethink this sensitivity to Drake Passage. Um, yeah. And they, what they did was um, ran then with an open Panama Seaway. And they found a big effect of the Drake Passage when you have an open, you know, when the Atlantic and the Pacific can kind of communicate more easily. And it was open until. Much later, you know, there was this long time where the Drake Passage opened while the Panama Seaway was still open. So, uh, and then they get a very large effect on the ITCZ. Um, it does shift uh, big time northward as you open up the as you open up the Drake Passage, or southward as you close it. Right. So, uh, still these these pieces of the puzzle that are like the AMOC causing the ITCZ to be north of the equator. We we or behind, but it seems like this Drake Passage thing needs to be revisited or, or tested in different kinds of models, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's sort of a slight stopping point here. Right. Um, yeah, I, I um, put a lot of slides in this talk. So, <laughs> uh, how about the winds? So this is the one that was very specifically to me suggested by reading these logs of, of Haley. Um, you know, he's talking about these really, really strong winds. And I think I'd never, yeah, so he, he, what, what determines the strength of these westerlies? Um, he called them the variables. I think that's what they, they called them back then, you know, because they change, right, um, so much with storm systems. It's not really just the westerlies, right? It's westerly, really strong westerlies, and then easterlies, and southerlies, and northerlies. Um, he called them the variables. And actually, eddies are of fundamental importance in determining the strength of those winds. Um, in an average, um, uh, to have surface westerlies, you have to have momentum flux convergence into the storm track regions, right? Into the jets. Um, so uh, yeah, um, you have to have constant momentum flux to support it, or those winds would slow down quickly. Um, and what converges the momentum? It's it's eddies um, that does that. Um, it's these variable storm systems as opposed to the calms or the, uh, the uh, easterlies, trade winds in the tropics. Um, uh, eddies create the momentum flux whenever you have stirring on a rotating planet. Um, basically, from Rossby wave dynamics, when Rossby waves are generated someplace and break uh, elsewhere, then you get momentum flux into where the eddies were formed. Um, so the eddies cause the momentum flux convergence. How do the eddies grow? Well, they grow due to bear clinic instability. Right? Um, and there's faster eddy growth when there's a bigger temperature gradient, you know, from ED model, Charney model. Uh, faster growth also when there is smaller stratification or higher latitudes, right? Um, so why is there a larger temperature? You know, why, why not? There is a clearly larger temperature gradient in the southern hemisphere. It's so cold in the high latitudes, right? So why isn't that the reason the winds are so strong there? I kind of like surveyed people and looked through textbooks, and that's never mentioned as a possibility um, to me. Everybody, to me, answered it's because it's a circumpolar 
ocean. There are no continents to disturb the storm track, and you know storms can make it all the way around and grow more. But it sort of means that that says something about linear theory, right? Um, that linear theory is not valid for some reason, or there's something that offsets it, or, or what? Um, so let's investigate that as a question. Um, yeah, I kind of had just never really it probably should have, but never had really recognized the difference in temperature gradient in the manual mean basis there. Um, yeah, um, alternate hypothesis again, so little land. And this is what's in the textbooks. This is what uh, people, you know, informally uh, seem, to, seem to say. Um, yeah, so let's test it. Why not, right? Um, this is still in progress. Um, and Sam Potter ran these uh, simulations. He was a Jaseo postdoc working with me. Um, and then uh, lately, some undergrad researchers have uh, taken up uh, this project, uh, Kit, John, and Thomas. Um, and basically, what we're doing is we're taking a fixed SST model and doing the same kind of modification where we symmetrize it, right? Um, and basically, symmetrizing the zonal mean, so adding whatever we need to make. 50 north equal in a zonal mean to 50 south. So we end up adding this profile to the SSTs. Um, so what effect does that have on the surface winds? Well, the zonal winds do weaken a little, but really not much at all. Actually, this is a change in surface zonal wind. Um, and it seems like really the dominant thing here is the changes driven by the tropics that Indeed, because we've directly forced the SSTs in the tropics, the ITCZ shifts southward big time. Um, and it seems like a lot of this is like wave train sort of responses to the movement of the precipitation. Um, we were, you know, so I think this kind of refutes that hypothesis and means that the land, no land reason is right to first order. Um, uh, all right. Um, so, but actually, adiakinetic energy does increase, does decrease in the Southern Ocean when you weaken the temperature gradient. Um, and that is correlated with an ED growth rate metric. Um, so, you know, some of these things that in textbooks and in, you know, a lot of my papers are very direct. Every single, you know, eddy, bear clinic growth to eddy kinetic energy, to momentum flux. There's part of that that's breaking down here with the momentum flux convergence. So why is that? Um, I think a lot of uh, folks are not surprised at this, because we know, for instance, that the ozone hole affects, you know, these stratospheric winds affect the surface winds in the southern ocean a lot, right? So it's not just bear clinic growth rates that affects the strength of the winds down there. Um, yeah. Um, so I think in some ways this isn't that surprising that uh, that the surface winds are affected by this, but you know the details of this I think are going to be really interesting. I kind of wanted to share share it with y'all, maybe get some feedback about this. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're going to just change the extra tropical SSTs, so keep the tropics exactly the same, so we won't get the ITCZ shift um, to maybe study more in detail without those tropically driven connections. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, the undergrads are working at it as we speak. So uh, yeah, um, that's it for the C, um, with the summary being that the AMOC causes large asymmetries in temperature, in precipitation, all the way down to the tropics. Um, it's why we think that the northern hemisphere is warmer than the southern hemisphere, which it is. Um, Sarah Kang studied that uh, problem in this uh, recent paper. Um, uh, but the, the strong winds seem to be more due to the circumpolar nature, but maybe stay tuned for that one. Um, uh, land is up next. So again, this is work with uh, Elizabeth. Um, uh, Going to look at the effect of an idealized continent on tropical rainfall um, in an otherwise ocean-covered planet. So we do a lot of these aquaplanet type simulations, so just the addition of a simple continent. Um, many, many effects of a continent. Um, albedo, heat capacity, subsaturation, right? No, limited availability of moisture, roughness, vegetation. Um, and here's that uh, result that I alluded to a little bit earlier that if you look at net TOA radiation, net shortwave, and OLR, both considered, then the Saharan Arabian Desert's the hottest place on Earth, right? Just leech energy to space like crazy. 
implying that there's an energy flux towards them. Right? So there's energy flux towards the Sahara. Um, just because it's so bright and it's so hot and low water vapor concentration that it radiates really easily and reflects a lot of sunlight too. Um, so uh, yeah, this albedo effect is pretty key, we think, without a doubt. So um, basically what uh, Elizabeth did was looked at the albedo effect separately from the subsaturation uh, question. So that's what I'm going to show next. Um, and uh, first we looked in this uh, gray radiation model, so really idealized physics um, model. Um, and that, the story is pretty simple, I think. It's just that this is the precipitation change when we add this little rectangularia continent or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, that you get a big decrease in precipitation right where the continent is. And then you get this decrease kind of where the moisture flux, you know, usually the stuff evaporates usually from there and would have rained here. So it's kind of like, it's, it's basically just the evaporation causing the drying here, we think. Um, not too much dynamical changes necessary to explain this. Um, yeah, um, so you just cut off the evaporation, and that reduces the precipitation there and downwind of it. All right. um, so I think this is a nice limit to kind of think about first. Um, then when she makes it brighter, when she adds the albedo effect, that cools the whole northern hemisphere, right? It, or at least cools right there, um, and that causes a requirement for energy transport towards that hemisphere and a bigger precipitation shift towards the hemisphere that didn't cool. Um, so even more dramatic there. Um, all right, so that's in the gray radiation model. Um, we like to use all different levels of a hierarchy here, so more complex models as well. Um, so the next results are going to be with a model that has clouds and stuff too. And clouds are always a complication. They're often the dominant thing that causes a change, you know, a difference between two GCMs. Um, and uh, here's what we get for that. It looks kind of like a completely different pattern, especially in the dark continent case, right? Um, that, by the way, this, this plot is from 20 south to 40 north, so we're really focusing on the ITCZ right here. Same with the last one. And red is drying and blue is moistening. Um, yeah, instead of kind of seeing the just over the continent and downwind, you see a lot of zonal variation, like a big southward shift just to the west of the continent, and not uh, so much to the east of the continent, actually a northward shift there. Um, yeah, uh, when you brighten the continent, then these big global energetic constraints take over, and you get a southward shift globally, clearly everywhere. Still, that's a function of longitude quite a bit, but uh, yeah. Um, but this one especially is kind of interesting, right? Why doesn't uh, why doesn't this evaporation the evaporation effect must be smaller, right? Um, so um, yeah, um, the temperature changes they show. This is in the gray model on the top here in the coupled model, or sorry, in the comprehensive model on the bottom. Um, and, uh, you know, the land warms up a lot just because you don't have the evaporation to cool it down, higher uh, Bowen ratio, right? So more sensible heat flux, um, so you get a really hot surface. Um, but you see this little cool area right here? This is basically low clouds forming uh, there um, that causes a lot of cooling. And we think that that really contributes to the local southward shift right around that area that you're getting low clouds to form, um, your easterlies blow in this direction. Um, it's really dry wind, so it starts, you get a lot of evaporation initially, that cools down the surface, forms some nice low cloud decks, just like we have in these locations in the real world, right? Um, and then when those clouds form, they are a big, big cooling effect, right? Low clouds. Um, so uh, we think that that's a really key ingredient to this uh, this response. Um, yeah. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the top model doesn't have that, so you don't get that effect, right? Um, yeah. 
I'm uh, very much just given the very surface explanation of this. So Elizabeth, uh, you know, can can tell you about all the details, or you can check out her papers about it. Um, but uh, yeah, um, she talks also about the dynamics that's induced by the continent uh, in this model, um, like monsoon type things that that happen uh, in that land surface. But we think that the stratus deck there is really key to to forming uh, this cold anomaly, and then the big southward shift right there. Um, yeah. She also did experiments with changing the width of that continent. Um, and these are all dark continents as well, same albedo as the ocean. Um, and as you widen it and widen it and widen it, basically the cloud deck stays about the same. Um, right? That stratus deck stays about the same. Um, so you get that little local southward shift a little bit, but when the continent becomes bigger and bigger, you get more of the local monsoon dynamics that shifts the precip north there. Um, so uh, yeah, um, and then again, when you add the albedo effect back in, that cools the hemisphere where there's more land and shifts everything southward. So um, this is a very, very uh, surface uh, description of some of these things, but I uh, just wanted to give some of the flavor of the idealized type of studies that we like to do, like I claimed we did yesterday, you know. Um, so I think Elizabeth probably will talk about that some maybe in her, in her talk uh, in the spring, um, or she's got these two papers about it too, so that are, that are really nice studies. Um, so that's the land. All right, I'm going through fast here, but how much time do I have? Uh, Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, getting low on time. That's all right. Um, only two. Oh, we're halfway done. So, <laughs> um, what about that big ice cube? Um, so, this is some experiments that we've done lately with uh, removing Antarctica it's completely, um, shaving Antarctica down, and seeing how that affects the global climate. And this initially was motivated by looking at these TOA radiation curves, just like uh, I showed. Uh, a couple slides back with the Sahara radiating so much, right? Um, can you see here that the Antarctica is this local maximum of TOA radiation um, as compared to the Arctic, um, despite the fact that it's so cold. In fact, because of the fact that it's so cold, right? It's white there, right? So very much reflects a lot. But since it's so high elevation, uh, it's really cold there. And that really cold means you don't radiate very much at all. So it's the OLR being very small um, as compared to the Arctic, which is balmy in comparison, radiates like crazy, and is more of an energy loss to space because of that. Um, so the claim here is that maybe the Ar Antarctic ice sheet actually warms the planet in terms of that coldness effect, at least. The height of it warms the planet because you don't get as much OLR because of that. All right. um, so let's test that. Um, flatten some ice. Um, so we keep it white, All right? And we just shave the shave the ice, right? Make some ice, uh, shave ice. <laughs> and uh, you get a massive temperature change over the continent, of course, right? But the whole rest of the planet cools. Um, and indeed, that's because of this requirement that if you're losing more energy to space, right? You're going to have energy flux towards it within the atmosphere, and uh, those places will cool in response to that. Um, and the global mean temperature, indeed, is cooler when you remove the ice sheet. Um, so we thought that was kind of a cool result. Um, yeah, um, It's just a few tenths of a K, right? So this is not a strong negative feedback <laughs> to climate change, you know? Um, not something that we should probably consider doing to prevent <laughs> climate change, you know, lopping off the West Antarctic ice sheet or something. Um, here are just some quick plots of the temperature with height in the zonal mean um, that it warms a lot aloft to the polar vortex weakens really substantially. It's probably due to some wave activity things. Um, a lot of cool stuff to study there potentially. Hansi did some of this. Um, Hansi Singh, uh, who just got her PhD at UW. Um, uh, and uh, Sisu Betts um, worked on this um, paper. Um, yeah, so they're kind of these interesting dynamical features that she studied as well. Um, and uh, it ends up that if you run this in slab mode, you get a big ITCZ shift away from 
Antarctica because you're kind of like losing so much energy to space there that the ITCZ shifts away from the cooling, shifts northward. But in when you run it fully coupled, you get not much of a change of the ITCZ because the ocean circulation is really important. There was a big change in the AMOC that happens in kind of an unpredictable way in this experiment. So we actually don't get much of a rainfall change in this uh, simulation. Um, yeah. Um, so we did this just for fun, you know? It was just kind of just to investigate, you know? And other people have done it, but not in coupled mode. Um, there's a lot of cool literature about uh, some of this stuff um, uh, in the past, but um, often fixed SST. So we kind of wanted to see the effects on energetics and stuff. But um, uh, Kat Hybers um, gave a talk on, on some of her work on this um, at AGU. and, and um, despite her being in the same department as Eric Steig. <laughs> um, Eric Steig saw it and he was like, ah, oh, this is a, he, he had this cool idea that, well, maybe actually if there's a systematic dynamical change to ice sheets that maybe you could detect from an East Antarctic ice core, for instance, that the West Antarctic ice sheet had collapsed. There was a very systematic change in wind patterns that would happen due to that, right? Then um, that would cause, say, a, t a warming at one particular part of the continent pretty systematically. Then maybe we could use that knowledge to have another way to figure out whether wastes collapsed in the past, which is a really, you know, important topic for for paleoclimate folks and to think about, you know, future changes with global warming too. Um, can we use ice cores from East Antarctica to figure out when West Antarctica collapsed. So we just took um, kind of some of our idealized simulations combined with more comprehensive model simulations um, and uh, you know some with very, very accurate waste topography that we collapsed, uh, found what we claim are some reasonable consistent dynamical responses that Eric now is using to help argue for having an ice core in one part of Antarctica rather than another um, that you know this this systematic dynamical effect from waste uh, yeah um, you know done by our goofy little idealized experiment um, might actually determine where an ice core <laughs> eventually was will be drilled you know um, so I think that's another way that idealized modeling can sometimes make uh, you think of new cool stuff to do with the full uh, system um, so anyway, you can check out our paper about this and uh, dispute those facts, uh, if you, if, you know, dispute our claims if you want. But uh, yeah, um, all right. And then the last part is mountains. Um, and this is also Elizabeth's uh, uh, master's work, I guess, right? Um, yeah, how Andes topography affects it. So we added these water Andes into a, a GCM and uh, looked at that because some folks like uh, David Batisti in particular, Ken Takahashi, have argued that that might be part of the reason why the ITCZ is north of the equator. Um, and uh, you do indeed get a big local effect when she adds that topography to the simulations, but it's kind of compensated elsewhere and ends up not being as much in the zonal mean. Um, yeah, and if you add an ocean heat transport, then you still see the effect of uh, that dominating over the Andes in the zonal mean. So this, this is more evidence that it's the AMOC that causes the ITCZ to be north of the equator, uh, generally speaking. Um, and then finally, um, southern African topography is one that we messed around with with Sam and a uh, really, really talented undergraduate researcher, Eliza Dawson, um, who uh, uh, we bulldozed Southern African topography, which is one of the uh, topographic influences that hasn't been studied as well um, in a fully coupled model and tried to look at how that maybe had an effect on the rainfall within the Atlantic. And uh, yeah, we do indeed get a really, really big uh, precipitation response that also is due largely to the cloud deck disappearing, that the subsidence coming over those mountains really helps low clouds form. Uh, in the South Atlantic, um, when you get rid of them, you get a massive warming in response to that that drags the precip southward. Um, and uh, uh, Sam and Eliza, they're claiming in this paper that, that 
the ocean circulation matters for de determining the amount and the shape of that precipitation response, but you still get it. So kind of got to look at these things in a couple models and, and figure that out. Um, so yeah, um, the low clouds burn off quite a bit in when you remove the mountains. So this is that change. Um, it doesn't look that impressive on this projector, but um, yeah, coupled ocean dynamics also being important for the structure of the precip response. Um, so anyway, um, conclusions, uh, it's really fun to just mess around with climate models. This is a chance to be creative and um, a good way to look at these diverse effects of the sea, land, ice, and mountains separately. Um, I'd argue that there's a really, really big importance to move up and down the hierarchy so that you're, when, if you're using an idealized model, which I think is really important, I'm really glad that NCAR has taken the lead with building a system of uh, idealized models um, that'll be you know, easily accessible to a lot of researchers. But I think it's really important too to move up the hierarchy you know, maybe if you're moving, if you're working with the most comprehensive models, to also consider how those problems could be tested in a simpler context. Um, and then uh, a lot of these, right? You probably noticed was um, really we're doing a lot of coupled stuff now, right? We're doing a lot of atmosphere ocean stuff, and I think there's been a lot of uh, recognition, you know, a lot coming from Boulder that that coupled dynamics are really, really important. And we're just at this new time where you can afford to run a thousand year simulation, which is necessary to spin up the deep ocean, even in an academic setting, right? You don't even need the huge supercomputers to run these anymore. Um, if you have a relatively low resolution coupled GCM, so we're, we're doing it a lot. And I know a lot of folks here are uh, doing it as well. Um, Clay's uh, telling me about some of his um, work on that. Um, and then uh, uh, my talk yesterday um, was about outreach. Um, and uh, I'm trying to break this idea that if you spend time on outreach that it makes somehow it makes your research worse because there's some kind of zero-sum game with time. I do not believe that one bit. I think a lot of my research has gotten a lot better when, you know, and communication about it and ways to isolate mechanisms, um, you know, has really improved by talking about it with the general public more. So um, check out my talk online if you want to see the ways that we've been doing that. But um, yeah, I, I really do think that it inspires research. Um, so that's the last uh, little thing there. So thank you all very much. <laughs>